In this lesson, we'll check out the individual brush categories and we'll learn how to use each type of brush. New in Corel Painter Essentials 8, the brushes have been separated into more categories. There's some new categories and 23 new brushes have been added. The new categories are Auto Painting and Touch Up, Photo Painting General, Markers and Inking Tools, there are five new patterns in the pattern pens, pencils, pens, these used to be combined, and then the last category is sponges. And then within each of these categories are some of the new brushes. You can also add tons of new brushes by clicking up in the top right here on this play button, or you can click on this button that says new brushes added. When you do that, it opens up the store where you can purchase brush packs, and all you need to do is just purchase the pack and install it, and then it will show up here in your brush selector as a category. Because I reset Corel Painter, I'll need to rearrange my workspace a bit. And now we're ready to dive into these specific categories. Let's start at the top with acrylics and oils. Acrylics and oils have a lot of similarities, so they really could be interchangeable here. We could paint with this clumpy brush, and this could be oil paint or acrylic paint. We can select a paper texture that looks more like a canvas, and we could choose a different brush that uses grain. Let's try broad cover brush. Now I have something that goes into the grain that looks a little bit more dry. Let's try Real Oils Filbert. This is a bristly brush, and this has very realistic bristles that follow your brush around. We can blend colors into that by selecting other colors here. And I'm being pretty spontaneous when I'm making these strokes. I'm varying my pen pressure and picking up my pen every now and then just to make sure that I deposit paint because if I paint and I just keep going, sometimes brushes turn into blenders and all they do is blend from that point on. But if you pick your brush up, it's like you're dipping your brush in more paint and the paint is replenished. As you can see, the paint kind of runs out. So I'll make a stroke, pick up my pen, and each time I'm getting more and more paint on my brush. So acrylics and oils give you a look, but they also give you a behavior. There's bristly brushes, there's brushes that run out of paint, there's brushes that look oily and brushes that blend. I'm not gonna go through every single brush here. You can feel free to experiment. Let's move on to the next category, which is airbrushes. There are two types of airbrushes. There are soft edge brushes, like the Digital Soft Pressure Airbrush. And you can use these to create really nice hand-painted gradients. Or there are proper airbrushes, which spray out particles of paint, like this brush here. You can see I can change the angle of the pen and it will sense bearing, and I can spray out paint in any direction I like. Let's try variable splatter, and we get something that's a bit more lumpy. The next category is artists, and these are brushes that emulate the style of famous artists. We have impressionist blender, and we can add paint, and if we keep painting, then we're going to blend. So we could create a really nice sky like this, and some land like this, and we can really easily make an impressionist painting without a whole lot of work. There is also the Sargent brush, named after the artist by the name of Sargent. I could put in a tree trunk like this, and Sargent gives me a really nice oily paint effect. The way that the colors blend together feels very natural. And of course, you can kind of smudge and blend like so. There is also the Van Gogh brush, this creates brush strokes with several colors in them. So if we wanted to, we could use this to put leaves on the tree, make them look like they're blowing in the wind there. You could even use this to put bark on the tree, like so, and some grass on the ground. These are some really interesting brushes. The next category is auto painting and touch up. That's followed by photo painting. We're gonna save these for the photo painting lesson. So let's skip on over to blenders. I'm gonna open the blenders template. One of the things I love about Corel Painter and why I'm drawn to it is the excellent blenders. A lot of art applications are lacking decent blenders. Corel Painter has proper blenders and there's a wide range of looks you can get out of your blenders. Let's try coarse oily blender. This kind of smudges and pulls the paint around. It looks oily and it has that coarseness of the paper texture. We can change the paper texture to something else and we can get a different pattern when we blend. Let's try another one. We'll try Coarse Smear Blender Jitter. This brush creates multiple dabs, and it's a dirty blender, so it has a little bit of your main and additional color blended in, 
Diffuser 1 looks like this. It just diffuses the edges, although this does add some white fringe to the edges if you paint near transparency. Here's Diffuser 2. This does not give you that white fringe, but it gives you a different look near the edges. Here's Directional Diffuser. It really breaks up the paint and gives you kind of more of a dry blend. But again, you get some of that white fringe. Here's Just Add Water. We can use this to get kind of a wet look where we're just adding water and then using that to blend the color together. This works really well for watercolor. If you blend too much and you want to reset this, you can always go to File Revert. Let's try one of these particle brushes. Particle brushes can dance and move around on their own, but they're also a little bit slower than some of the regular brushes. And I can use these to get some really interesting blending results. And last, we'll try Wet Oily Blender. This is yet another type of blender, and it gives you a really nice wet oily result. If I use a bigger brush, I can really blend this together. You can see if I use lighter pressure, then I can get some of that paint texture, which is based on my paper texture I have selected. And then you can customize these blenders by playing with the opacity and the grain to get even more looks out of these blenders. I'll return to a blank canvas, and next we'll take a look at chalk, pastel, and crayons. These are all hard media brushes, many of which are using what is called a captured dab, which is essentially an image-based dab. So Concept Jitter Art Smooth, if we make that very large, and just tap with our pen, creates a dab. And a stroke is just a lot of overlapping dabs that give the illusion of a continuous line. You can get a lot of really interesting looks out of these brushes, and many of them respond to paper grain as well. So I could change my paper grain to something like this, and if I paint with this brush, I can build up that texture. If I press harder, I'm going to completely cover the grain. If I press lightly, then that grain shows through. I can switch my paper to something else like this woven pattern, and now I get a completely different look. I use these brushes a lot for adding texture over things. They work really well for rocks and fabric and pretty much anything that has a repeating pattern. This flatter dab here called Stick can use pen tilt. If I keep my pen upright, I'll get a thin line. If I tilt my pen, I can change the profile and make it wider, so I can elongate that dab. This gives me a really interesting effect because now I can draw with something that looks a lot like a palette knife simply by changing the tilt of my pen. If I don't like all that texture in the stroke, I can always increase my grain to 100% and then change my paper texture to something that's a little less contrasty like basic paper. Now I have something that looks more like a palette knife. Moving on to the next brush category, we have dab stencils. While the previous brushes were based on certain kinds of tools or media, this category is based on a feature called dab stencils, and it can apply to brushes that could be in any of these categories. So for example, there's a chalk brush in here, but there's also a soft brush and a bristle brush and a blender and a flat brush. So this is kind of a mixed media category. I'm going to select Flowmap Chalk first. Now Flowmap refers to something that's in the full version of Corel Painter, but it also applies to Dab Stencil. So the Dab Stencil is using the Flowmap, which is found here in the properties bar, to stencil the dab. So I'll show you what I mean. If I build up a stroke using really light pressure, and then start to increase my pressure, you can see that Dab Stencil appearing. And that's in addition to the texture that I'm getting from my paper. So I can change my paper texture to something else, and you can see the difference that makes. So it's just an additional layer of texture that I can apply. We can stencil the dab with a different flow map. Let's try Fine Dots. And now we get two patterns that are very similar overlapping on top of each other, creating a new pattern. That's actually really interesting to see all those different patterns that are created. Let's try another combination of dab stencil. Let's look for something that looks a little bit rocky, like gravel. And let's complement that with a paper texture that also looks rocky, like simulated wood grain. This works really well for creating rocky looking stuff, dirt, mountains, stone, just about anything. Put another layer over that. You can begin to make it look sort of textured. If I wanted it to look layered like sedimentary rock, I could do that. You can see all those horizontal patterns in there being created by the dab stencil, which is based off of a flow map. Let's take a look at the other brushes and dab stencils. There's Flowmap Burst. If I paint with this brush, it's a particle brush, 
And so the particles are kind of spraying out in a really chaotic way. It gives me a really interesting pattern here if I vary my pen pressure. And again, I can change that dab stencil to something else, like hot lava, and now I get a completely different pattern. These are really fun brushes to experiment with. As I mentioned, there's blenders and other types of brushes, so feel free to go in here and check it out. The next category is digital watercolor. This is one of three types of watercolor found in the full version of Corel Painter, but in Corel Painter Essentials 8, there's only this one version, digital watercolor. It's the least realistic of all the watercolor technologies in Corel Painter, but it's also the fastest and the most versatile because you can use it on a regular layer. I'll choose coarse water. And when you're painting with watercolor, typically you want to choose lighter colors because the lightness or darkness of colors controls the saturation of pigment in your stroke. So if you want to load your brush more with paint, you'll make your color saturated. If you want to load it more with water, then you'll select a lighter color. To show you what I mean, I'll paint on my canvas and it's like I have some blue paint, but it's very diluted with water and I can continue to build it up, but it stays pretty light. But as I start to saturate that blue, then you can see that it starts to be a little bit more opaque. And when it's fully saturated, it's like I have a lot of blue pigment concentrated in my stroke. I can select other colors and overlap them, and they sort of mix together in a watercolor way. This is not the most realistic watercolor that Corel Painter can achieve. If you're using the full version of Corel Painter, there are two other types of watercolor that are much more realistic, but these will give you a decent effect. There are properties that are specific to digital watercolor. We can set the diffusion. Diffusion is the paint traveling through the water or spreading out, so that'll make your edges softer if diffusion is higher or sharper if diffusion is lower. So you can think of this as wetter or drier brush strokes. I'll set that back to kind of a middle range. You can also adjust the wet fringe, which controls the amount of water and paint available for diffusion at the edges of the brush stroke. To see how this is gonna work, I'm gonna select new simple water. Right now it has no wet fringe. We'll just paint a stroke here. And you can see it's a pretty flat brush. I'll do a dab so you can see how that dab looks. Now if I go in here and I add some wet fringe, you can see that it dynamically changes the fringe on that brush stroke. So I can add more fringe or more paint that collects along the edge. Now the diffusion is not dynamic. When you change diffusion, you actually have to paint a stroke and then set the diffusion to a different value and then paint another stroke. But when you adjust the wet fringe, it applies to all strokes equally. Now you can dry the paint, and when you do that, it locks in the fringe. So now if I change it, it's not going to do anything. And I could paint a new brush stroke and go in and change that fringe, and it won't affect the fringe that I've already dried to the canvas. So if the paint is wet, it's still editable with these sliders. If it's dry, it's not. At the bottom here, it recommends that you use the gel composite method. So if I were to create a new layer, I'd wanna set that to gel. I'll paint with some yellow over the top of this and you can see why. If we set this to normal, then it turns into opaque paint that covers the paint underneath and does not look like watercolor. You can also choose multiply if you want kind of a wet inky look, but gel will give you a little bit of fringe along the edges that shifts the hue a bit. So you can see the edges are a bit more orange when I let them build up or a bit more red, or if I use a bluish color, then you can see that they're more indigo. So what I mean by shifting in hue is the hue moves a little bit. If I sample this yellow color, you can see that hue ring moving ever so slightly. And this is just simulating how a concentrated pigment like watercolor would look. You can also dry the watercolor from up in the properties bar up here. And if you wanted to, you could select other brushes, such as your blender brushes. And if you wanted it to look a little bit more wet or blend it together, then you could use those blenders. Go ahead and clear these layers out. I'll put down some yellow paint. I'll select white. And if I paint with white, you can see it's like I'm adding plain water to kind of diffuse the paint that's already there or maybe remove some of it. It works as kind of a blender or an eraser and it gives you a really nice effect. You can also see some of that paper grain. So if I change that paper grain to something else, then I'll start to see a crosshatched pattern. I can remove that grain if I don't want to see any of it and then I can get a flatter look. Another nice thing about watercolors is that you can layer them up. So I can add in these really nice pinkish colors and they start to kind of blend in gradually. Add some oranges and blend it into that. Heavier pressure will give you a more opaque stroke. Lighter pressure will give you a more transparent stroke. If you find that a brush is too concentrated, you can also reduce the opacity of it as well. And then it will just take longer to build up. 
Let's take a look at another way we can mix colors together. First, we'll need to go ahead and dry that digital watercolor. Then we can select a blender. I'll select just add water. And now I can blend those colors together. So I've essentially dried the paint and that allows me to work on it with other brushes, but it's no longer able to interact with wet paint, which I would create with the digital watercolor brushes. If I make my brush bigger, I can make that transition a bit smoother and wetter looking. And that gives you a pretty good effect, and it works better than painting with white paint sometimes to blend out that watercolor. One thing that can really help your digital watercolor look more realistic is to create a layer on top of everything. We'll just call it paper. Let's fill that with an overlay composite method. I'll select a watercolor paper, like Italian watercolor paper. Then I'll go to Effects, Fill. I'm gonna fill with current color and just set that to 128 all the way around. And I'll fill with that. Now I'll go to Effects and let's add some surface texture. Now if I reduce the opacity of that, I get a little bit of texture on top of everything. And if I go back to that layer that I was painting on with the watercolor, I'll just name that watercolor. I'll lock my paper layer by clicking right here next to the layer or by clicking on the lock icon. That way I don't accidentally paint on my paper. And I can paint beneath it on the watercolor layer using watercolor brushes or blenders. Let's try spatter water. We get a really nice splatter effect. Let's try pure water. This is just a wet brush that can kind of blend the paint a little bit and smudge it around. Let's try salt. And salt will erode your paint. So there's some really cool effects you can get here if you experiment with this watercolor. Watercolor painting is really its own separate discipline, so I recommend checking out some of my other videos that go more in depth into watercolor. I'm gonna clear out these layers. I'll need to unlock this one to clear it out. And let's move on to the next brush category, which is dynamic speckles. Dynamic speckles is another one of those mixed media categories where it's based on a technology and not necessarily on a medium. So as you can see, there's blenders and bristle brushes and particle brushes all lumped together in here. There are two types of dynamic speckle brushes, the dynamic speckle bristle and dynamic speckle particle, which has a few different modes. You can see those modes represented in the icons here. There are particles that flow. There are particles that clump together and act like a chain. There are particles that can twirl around. There are particles that emanate from a nucleus. And the behaviors of these particles can change drastically. We'll learn more about all that stuff when we explore the particles category. Let's start with hard bristle. This is a dynamic speckle bristle brush. If I paint a stroke with this brush and use lighter pressure, you can see those bristles. If I make a large brush and select black and tap and hold, you can see these are the dynamic speckles. And if I do a quick light tap, I can make them smaller. As I increase my pen pressure, they get larger for this particular brush. Dynamic speckles are the most realistic bristle brushes in Painter, and you can even control the speckle size up here at the top in the properties bar. Right now the speckle size is set to 65, and speckle size is going to control the size of these speckles. So if I make that smaller, then I'm going to get tiny speckles no matter how hard I press. If I set speckle size all the way to 100%, and I'm gonna get these really big clumps. But I've created a different brush now that might be used for a completely different purpose. If I just dab with this brush, then I'm getting something that looks like a sponge and might work well for foliage. Add some different colors to it and you can see they blend in nicely. You get a lot of nice randomization out of these dynamic speckles and kind of blend these together like so. I could even play with the opacity if I want this to be more of a glazing brush that builds up more slowly. That would help those transitions and color blend in a little more smoothly. So although this is a dynamic speckle bristle brush, it doesn't mean that you have to use it for bristle brush painting. Let's try FlowJet next. This is a dynamic speckle flow particle brush. Flow type particles can flow in a particular direction. This brush will flow based on my pen tilt. So I can tilt my pen and have it flow this way, or I can tilt it a little bit more, and I can get all kinds of different directions here out of my brush. Just like with the previous brush, I can change the speckle size. So if I want that speckle size to be larger, then I can have the speckles that come out be larger, or I can have them be much finer. The size of the brush will also determine the size of the speckles. So if I make a really large brush, those speckles will be a little bit larger, but they also spread out a lot more. 
If you had a black background like this and you were painting on a layer, this brush might work really well to create space scenes, or maybe even something like sand. Let's take a look at another particle type. Let's try particle bristle. This is giving me a bristle brush, but these particles move around a little bit more dynamically. So if I swing my brush around, you can see those particles kind of whip around. I'll do a really big brush with a big motion and you can see they stray away from my cursor and kind of do their own thing and then snap back in. Let's try a different particle type. Here's particle grainy. This one strays quite a bit more and has a lot more of its own movement. You can also utilize the paper grain. If it ever says grainy in the name, then you know it's a brush that can utilize the paper grain. So let's try something like small dots. And you can see it has that dotted pattern within it. So those are the dynamic speckle brushes. We'll take a look at the remaining particle brush types when we look at particle brushes. Let's move on to effects. There's a lot of different stuff going on in this category. There are some brushes that are based on natural media. There are some distortion brushes. There's some image hose nozzles and there's some effect brushes. I'm gonna open the distortion template and that will help me demonstrate some of these brushes. I'll start with Distorto. If I make my brush larger and I paint on this grid background, you can see that I'm able to pull those pixels and smudge them around. So imagine that this is wet paint and I'm just pulling a brush or my finger across it. I could do that with my eyes too, to distort my eyes or to move my hair. Typically you wouldn't make such large distortions, but if you wanted to just nudge things around a bit with this brush, then you can do that. If something's sticking out too much, or you just wanna reshape something without having to repaint it. Maybe the ear is shaped differently and you just wanna fix that. Now, of course, I'm being kind of heavy handed about this just for demonstration's sake. You'd wanna be a little bit more careful. If you don't want the brush to be so strong, you can change the grain, let's say to 9%. Now I can nudge that a bit more gently so it doesn't go too far. And you could use that to nudge the eye up, reshape the eyebrow, reshape the nose, and so on. It could even make me look like I'm smiling. Let's check out some of the other brushes in the effects category. Hurricane is also a distortion brush. You could use that on my hair or on the background, and you can see that it just kind of twirls the pixels around. Let's try Shattered. Shattered just breaks up your image as if it's shattered glass. A lot of this stuff is probably more useful for abstract art. Let's try fairy dust. We can get little sprinkles of light. This could be good for space backgrounds. The glow brush is incredibly useful. I'm gonna go ahead and just revert this. If I sample my blue background color, I can make it glow and build up. This is an airbrush that essentially builds up the color to white, but it also shifts the hue as you move toward the edge of the brush. So it goes from cyan to blue. If I selected a reddish color like this, and I have it build up, you can see that nice shift. Or if I do a yellowish color, you can see that it just looks really natural. If I were using this for a grayscale painting, then I could use it kind of like Dodge to lighten up the painting. Works really well for lighting effects. It can also be really useful for shading objects. For example, if I just make this sphere here, I can simply select the glow brush. I don't even have to change my color. I just have to paint on it here in the same spot over and over again until it builds up and gets lighter and lighter. Then I have a nice sphere. I'm gonna go back to my blank canvas and let's take a look at the image hose nozzle brushes. Let's just start with linear. This is a special type of brush in Corel Painter and it allows you to paint with images rather than dabs. And unlike most stamp brushes, you can paint with multiple images and you can even use brush expressions to have those images come out in different ways. So let's try this example called Canadian geese. Your brush size is going to determine the size of the elements that come out of the brush. So if we want our geese to be about this size, we can draw with Canadian geese. Now the image hose nozzle is what comes out of the brush. If you could imagine a garden hose, the geese are the water coming out of the hose. The image hose is like the end or the attachment that's on your hose that determines if the water's gonna spray out or if it's gonna come out as a jet. So right now we have it coming out as a jet, but if we wanted it to spray out, we could choose spray. And now the geese kind of spray out. You don't have to use your brush. You can also use your mouse. And I think for this particular nozzle, I'd probably wanna just click with my mouse to create some individual geese. But you can see it's not the same image being repeated. It's maybe two or three or four images being repeated.
I could also tap lightly to make geese that are farther away, or I could tap really hard to make a goose that's closer. If we change our background color to something that's more appropriate, we might be able to see that better. I can do geese that are far away and geese that are close. We can go in here and we can change to something else. Let's say we want to put some trees in here. If you create a new layer, we can put in some trees. These geese are going on vacation. Forget Canada, I'm going to California. Let's see what else we have here. I have some paragliders, why not? And why not a house where we can watch all the action? Now I can make my brush really, really, really big and I can get a really big house. But just keep in mind that the maximum size you can make your brush is going to be determined on the size of the captured asset. So the house might look good really large, but if I make a really, really large Canadian goose, it's gonna look a little bit blurry because it's not meant to be used that large. This kind of looks like a scene from the birds. Oh wait, there we go, that's much better. Okay, let's clear out all this nonsense. You might be wondering if you can create your own image shows nozzles. Unfortunately, you cannot in Curl Painter Essentials 8, but you can in the full version of Curl Painter. And let me tell you, these image hose nozzles can do some pretty cool things. While I don't really use these stock image hose nozzles, I do find my custom image hose nozzles to be really useful. For example, if I painted my own flowers, then I could really quickly make a field of flowers that are my own rather than something that's more of like a stock art thing. Or if I were doing leaves on trees rather than painting a million leaves, I could paint a few clumps of leaves and then paint a tree like so but I could do the leaves in any style. They could be brush strokes or really whatever I like. And you can use the default brushes within Curl Painter to create those strokes. So for example, I could go to Artists, Impressionist Blender, and if I made a bunch of leaves this way and put some highlights on top of them and so on, then I could turn that into an Image Hose nozzle. Image Hose will also let you use the additional color. If I select the additional color variant, I have my leaves here that I can paint. If I click on my additional color and I choose a color, let's say blue and paint, my leaves are gonna be tinted blue. Now I can control that amount of tinting using the grain slider. I know it says it's for grain, but this is actually being used for something completely different. If I reduce grain, let's say down to 16, now I'm gonna have really blue leaves that still have a little bit of that value and color from the original image. That gives me a really nice three-dimensional effect. I could have red leaves or yellow leaves like so. Moving on to the next category, we have the glazing brushes. Glazing is yet another category that's based on a brush technology. Let's start with soft. Glazing is a traditional art technique where you use thin transparent layers of color to build up color on top of a painting. So I'm using very, very light pressure right now to get a very light glaze. But if I start to use heavier pressure, then I can make that glaze thicker, making the paint that I'm applying thicker or more opaque. This could be opaque paint, or I could make it transparent paint simply by changing the composite method to something like gel. If I wanted to put some purplish colors into that, and I can glaze over it with purple, and you can see that I can layer up these colors really nicely. If I open this glazing grayscale template, I have this turtle painting in grayscale, and I can actually glaze over this. I'm on the glaze here layer, which is set to a multiply composite method. I'll use that soft brush, select a green color, I can glaze over the grass, I'm being really super sloppy here just because I want to be fast. And it just shows you that I can colorize that grass. If I want to colorize the turtle, I can colorize the turtle, and so on. So again, you would want to take more than 10 seconds to do this, but it gives you an idea of how you might use the glazing brushes. And I can choose other colors here and put those in, and so on. But the lighter pressure, the more it's going to just ever so slightly blend in. Now glazing works a bit differently than something like opacity. I won't get into the technical details here, but essentially it gives you more control over opacity when you're controlling it with pen pressure. I'll clear out that glaze and let's take a look at some of the other types. There's some particle type brushes where the glaze will just spray out like so. There are some bristle type brushes if you want a more bristly look for your glaze. But these are really fun brushes, and I do use the glazing technique a lot when I'm painting. Glazing brushes also have the glazing property, and this sets the maximum level of opacity in a brush stroke. So if you want a brush to put down really, really, really thin paint, set glazing lower, and no matter how hard you press, it's going to build up very slowly. One of the great things about glazing is that because you can use pen pressure to control opacity, 
you don't have to change your color as often. So you can see if I were going to do something in grayscale, I can get kind of a mid-tone value here just by using lighter pressure. And then if I wanted to create a shadow, I just increase my pressure. And I can kind of fade it in like so. Likewise, I could select a lighter color and I'll just do this on a new layer. And I can create a highlight just using lighter pressure to fade it out and heavier pressure to make it look brighter. I'm gonna delete that gel layer and just clear out this default layer. Let's take a look at the next category and that is markers and inking tools. This is another category of brushes that are kind of all lumped together. There are dry ink brushes and these are brushes that give you kind of a liquid ink effect. There's little speckles like so. Or there's a felt marker. And if we select yellow, we create a new layer for our marker since it's kind of a transparent ink and we set that to gel. And you can see we get something that looks like we're drawing with a felt marker. This is using the marker technology, so as you build it up, it's going to shift in hue a bit, kind of like a real marker would. There's fine point marker, which does the same thing, it just has a finer point. There's also some Sumi E. This is a special type of Eastern painting. And then we have hatch. This is a captured dab that just gives you kind of a hatched effect. Since it's a marker, it also creates a gel layer for you. And that should give you a pretty good idea of what the markers and inking tools can do. Let's move on to particles. Now we looked at particles earlier when we checked out dynamic speckles. I'm gonna fill my canvas with black so you can see this more easily. I'll make a really big brush and I'll move it around. You may be able to see those particles following my brush. Particles follow the laws of physics. So with this particular brush, if I move this brush around, you can see the particles just follow behind in single file. They look kind of like a tail. If I try a different type of particles, let's say flow flare, make a really big brush and just tap and hold, you can see those particles moving about. Now these particles emanate from the center of the brush and kind of dance around. They appear and disappear randomly, so they create kind of a speckled pattern, which I'll show you in a bit. Let's try gravity bristle, make a bigger brush. And you can see those particles are following my brush, but they're staying spaced out from each other. Here's spring rainbow silk. This is more of a geometric pattern where there's springs in between the different particles, which will also create lines, and spring silk flower. So now that you understand how the particles are moving about, the particles and springs are what's going to apply paint to the canvas, just like a bristle would apply paint to the canvas. If we enable glow, that'll allow us to paint on a dark background, and it works very much like the glow brush. I'll need to be painting on a regular default layer for these to work. If I tap and hold, you can see the brush builds up like the glow brush did. If I don't want it to build up too quickly, I want to choose a darker color. This brush is also using some color variability, so I'm getting some green here. That color variability is coming from my additional color, so this is one of the few brushes that uses the additional color. So I'll click on the additional color, and let's choose something maybe like a magenta color. Now I'm getting magenta and purple mixed together in the stroke, which looks really nice. But as you can see, it's the particles and the springs that are creating the lines. Let's select a different particle brush. Let's try Flow Fur. I'll need to enable Glow for this brush. Let's switch back to our main color. And let's pick a furry color that's kind of brownish. We'll paint with this, and you can see that we can create this really nice fur effect. The movement of the particles simulates the movement of fur. I can also tilt my brush to spray that fur in a particular direction. This would be really helpful if I were shading an animal and I wanted to get the contours right. With this color, it looks kind of like fire almost, but I could choose a darker color like that and have it build up a little bit more slowly, maybe a grayer color like that, and then I could even go and glaze over it if I wanted to color it manually. I can also use it on a light background if I disable glow, and I fill my background color with something different and we'll see how it looks when I use it like this on a light background. This is a great brush for pet portraits and things like that. And we'll just take a look at the gravity type brushes now. If I tap and hold with this brush, you can see the little particles kind of fan out from the middle, and they move around a bit and do their own thing depending on how rapidly I move the brush. So this would be a good bristle brush if you wanted something that's just a bit more expressive. Might work well for hair too if you pull out really long, quick strokes like this. The gesture that you're making is really important for these brushes. 
Let's move on to the next category, and that is pattern pens. Pattern pens are kind of similar to image hose brushes. They will allow you to paint with patterns, but the pattern's gonna come out in a different way than it does with the image hose. Let's start with pattern pen masked. The pattern that we have selected is what's going to come out of the brush. So let's choose fire, and I'll just paint a horizontal stroke, and you can see that I can create fire. If I create a curved stroke, you can see that the pattern follows the direction of my pen. This is called pattern pen masked, because some of these images have a transparent background, so masked gives you the option to mask away or remove that background. If we try the same pattern with the regular pattern pen, you can see that that transparent area is filled in with black and there's no semi-opaque pixels. If we try pattern pen soft edge, then it attempts to kind of fade it out to a softer edge, but you still get that black in there. So any of these patterns where you see black along the edges, those are the ones that you're gonna to wanna to mask. But it doesn't mean that any pattern with black in it is gonna behave that way, because if we select hazard, hazard goes all the way to the edge. And so even if I choose pattern pen masked, that black still remains in the stroke. Now pattern pens can respond to pen pressure, so I can draw a line that looks pretty interesting. I could select tree trunk pen. I could create really nice tree branches like this. I'm just varying my pen pressure and using lighter pressure at the end of the strokes. Have kind of the branches overlap like this. This is a really, really cool brush technology. If you wanted to, you could even go in here, right click on this layer, select layer content, create a new layer above it, set that layer to multiply. Then you could select something like an airbrush or maybe even a glazing brush. I'll choose a digital soft pressure airbrush. And if you wanted to add a little bit more shading or glazing to these branches to change the color or make them just look a little bit more realistic, you could do that as well. And again, I'm just being sloppy here for example's sake, but you can see what you can do. That glazing or that tinting is on a separate layer. The next brush category is pencils. Let's try Soft 2B. This is one of my favorite pencil brushes because I can draw upright to make the line thinner or tilt my pencil to make it thicker. And I can really easily shade with the side of the pencil. It feels very intuitive and very natural. You could even hold your pencil like this if you prefer to draw this way. It just gives you more expressive marks. I could change my paper texture to something that looks more like paper. If I don't want that canvas look, this is a really great pencil. There are other types of pencils. There's cover pencil. It's a bit more flat looking. There's a glazing pencil, which is just a bit softer. And there's an oily pencil and so on. So you can feel free to experiment with these. These are great brushes for sketching. Let's try Soft 6B. This gives you kind of a more smudgy, softer look. And we could even use it as colored pencils too if we wanted to select a color. Next is pens. Pens are a little bit different than the markers and inking tools. These are pens that are more geared toward inking line art and things like that. The scratchboard tool is one of my favorite brushes and one that I use a lot. It gives you a very, very smooth line that's fully opaque and has a nice smooth edge. So if I use a bigger brush, you can see this is a great flat brush. It responds really nicely to pen pressure. The only thing about this brush is that occasionally it does leave these little specks that you'll have to go and paint over, but they're so small that you may not even notice them. This tends to happen if you use a larger brush, but if you're using this mainly for inking, then you don't have to worry about that. Let's check out some of the other pens. We have flat color, which is not a fully opaque brush. So you may find that you want to use this just to do flat colors in your artwork. And that maybe this is more of a coloring brush rather than an inking brush. We have smooth calligraphy. This could be a good brush for writing calligraphy and things like that. And we have drippy pen, which gives you something that looks more irregular. And the last category is sponges. Let's just select the regular sponge. Many of these brushes are captured dabs. So if I just tap with this, you can see all it's doing is just repeating that dab. And if I build it up, then I get a really nice spongy pattern. These brushes work great for trees and all kinds of grassy foliage things. Put down a green color, put some lighter greens over it, and so on. You could reduce the opacity, of course, if you wanted to have it build up a little more slowly. You could even use it to add texture to rocks and things like that. There are other types of sponges in here as well, but they all do pretty much the same thing. 
glazing sponge will just build up like glazing brushes would. And you can control the glazing here as well. Let's try a soft texture. And this particular brush can also utilize the dab stencil. So I could set that to something different and get a completely different result. This particular brush also has a bit of white fringe to it. So if you ever notice that a brush is behaving this way, one thing that you can do is you can change the composite method to gel cover, multiply, or gel depending on the kind of blend that you want to get. Gel cover works the best if you want a more opaque paint. That's it for the brush categories in Curl Painter Essentials 8. As I mentioned earlier, you can add loads and loads of new brushes. Once you install them, they will appear near the bottom of your brush selector in their own categories. Before we end this lesson, I want to discuss choosing the right brush. Having to choose from so many brushes can be intimidating, but what I would recommend is just experiment with these brushes, and when you find brushes you like, just write down the name in the category. If it helps, you can write a little note next to the brush describing what it's useful for. Or if you wanted to, you could even go in here, choose a brush, paint it on your canvas, and write a little note next to it with the text tool, and then you could say, good for trees. And then you at least have some idea of how you're going to use these brushes, and you can build up a collection that works for you. I use the full version of Corel Painter, and I have tons and tons of custom brushes, but I really only use a handful of brushes for each painting I create. Most of the brushes are just specialty brushes that I use on occasion. The brushes that I use the most that are found in the full version of Corel Painter and in Painter Essentials are Airbrushes Digital Soft Pressure, in Blenders, the Diffuser, in Chalk Pastels and Crayon, these square chalk brushes are really useful. In the FX category, I use the Distortion Brush a lot, as well as the glue brush. In the pencils, I like the soft 2B pencil. And in pens, I like the scratchboard tool. And in sponges, the regular old sponge works really well. I could probably do a whole painting with just those brushes. That brings us to the end of our look at the brush categories. Coming up in the next lesson, we'll explore layers, the canvas, and effects in more detail.